Hey, friends and clever listeners, guess what? We are almost at 200 episodes. Can you believe how old we are? That means we have hundreds of episodes of interesting stories from fascinating people. So go to your podcast app or cleverpodcast.com slash episodes dash list and scroll through all of them to pick out the ones you haven't heard yet. It also means that we're getting ready for a big celebration. More on that later. Stay tuned. In the meantime, we're queuing up a few extra memorable episodes from the archive to commemorate this upcoming milestone. So if you have any favorites or requests, be sure to let us know. Is there someone special you'd really love to hear from for episode 200? Or maybe there's an interview from a while back that has really stuck with you. We live for this, so please leave us a comment on Instagram or even better, email us a voice memo. You know we love to hear your voice. Send it to hello at cleverpodcast.com. And now, please enjoy this encore presentation. You're moving along solving specific problems as you understand them within the context of the realm of the time and where you're working. The idea that you are predicting these things or that these things become culture or happenstance. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers and this is Clever. For this episode, I'm speaking with the legendary Paula Scher. Whether or not you're consciously familiar with some of her iconic record covers and corporate identities, you've definitely experienced her work. It has helped to shape our collective culture by virtue of its power, ubiquity, influence, and zeitgeisty resonance. A graduate of the Tyler School of Art, she got her professional start in 1970s New York in the music business, first designing ads and then art directing record covers, including some you probably remember for bands like Cheap Trick, Bruce Springsteen, Boston, Billy Joel, and many jazz artists. In 1991, she became the first female partner at world-renowned design consultancy Pentagram, where she still is today. She's known for her spirited use of type, and in the 1990s created a landmark identity for the public theater, which kind of changed everything. That, plus identities for brands such as Citibank, Tiffany & Co., and Shake Shack, among others, have cemented her reputation as one of the most influential graphic designers in the world. I met up with her at the 2019 Adobe Max conference, where we sat down in the Airstream podcast lounge to record this conversation. As you'll hear, she's irreverent, opinionated, wise, and always in forward motion. This one made a big impression on me, and I'm very excited to share it with you. So Paula, take it away. My name is Paula Scher. I live in New York City. I um, am a graphic designer, a painter, and um, I do both of those things because I love making things. And does that start all the way at the beginning? Let's let's it, go back to zero and figure out how you got to be who you are. I used to draw and paint in my room when I was a little girl. And yeah. I usually retreated there because if, if something made me sad, I would go in the room and I would start drawing and painting. If something made you sad, it was turbulent at home? It was turbulent and it was also uh, my way of escaping. Mm-hmm. All things. Yeah. Uh, back in that generation, too, parents weren't particularly... It wasn't in the parenting paradigm to really help children process their emotions. I didn't really give it much thought. I just made drawings. Okay. <laughs> so it was uh, a way for you to escape, but it was also something you were enjoying. I mean, well, I, getting... I was escaping to something. I was escaping to the this activity that felt great because... I would start slow, and then I would start to find myself, and then I would feel terrific. Was it just the the technical aspect of drawing, or did you feel like you were expressing unexpressible emotions that you didn't have language for? I wasn't that deep. Okay. <laughs> I was okay. a little kid, and I made yeah. drawings. Sometimes I made drawings that tried to be realistic. Sometimes I made drawings of my own paper dolls or superheroes or mm -hmm. things that kids draw, and I liked doing it, and I felt better when I was doing it than not. Were you supported as a creative person or were you kind of guided to be something a little more, um, I don't know, serious or secure? 
I had trouble when I wanted to go to college. As a, as a kid, I went to Corcoran School of Art in Washington, D.C. My mother paid for weekend classes, and I used to take three buses from Silver Spring, Maryland to Washington, D.C., and I remember going into the school. I was about 12, and I would see beatniks. I never saw beatniks in my suburban neighborhood. That was really exciting. People with little goatees and women with long hair over their eyes and things that ways people didn't look in the suburbs in the, the 60s. It opened my eyes. I mean, I knew what I wanted to be. I saw these other people, and they were older than me, and I thought, I want to be like them. And that was when you were 12. Yeah. So that lasted all the way through the teenage years? And In, in my school, in my high school in, in Maryland, I was the school artist and I made the um, posters for all the proms and all the, all the events and never went to them, but made the posters for them. And now I do the same thing. I make posters for shows <laughs> I'm never going to go see. <laughs> How would you describe your teenage years? Were you rebellious? Were you studious? Were you I was rebellious. Rebellious. Uh, but, in a stealthy but, way, like not acting out to get attention, but or no, I, I had I had difficulties with my parents. I had difficulties with my s suburban lifestyle, and I went to Tyler School of Art in the '60s and uh, became a hippie. You oh, know, okay. I, mean, I, I did all that. I loved Tyler. It was a great experience, and I discovered design in my junior year really seriously. And I was sort of a, I would say, not a terrific student my first two years, and then got serious my second two, and and knew exactly what I was going to do, and moved moved to New York after I graduated college. Did you enjoy being a hippie? Yeah. It was fun. Yeah, it seems fun. I mean, I, I'm trying to live vicariously through you. You're not giving me too many. Well, details. I wasn't. I wasn't a Janis Joplin hippie. I didn't look quite that beat up. Um, I was. I was right on the fringe. But it, there was a, a liberation associated with it, right? Like, well, it was political. You, it, was... It, it was political. You know, there was Vietnam War was raging, and there was a peace movement, and there were women's rights to be considered, and there was that movement, and there there was the civil rights. Uh, movement. All of them were coming together at the time I was in college. It was the 60s. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand that. And I'm just acknowledging the liberation of finally there's a consensus that we need to speak out. We need to say something. We need to sort of resist the status quo. I think that so the suburban lifestyle that was generated, which was supposed to be the good life, you know, after World War II, created all kinds of uh, sort of artificial forms of behavior that had to do with fitting in or conforming to a group. And I find that Facebook is very much resembles suburban Maryland to me. You know, people liking this and they put the picture of the baby picture up and they do, you know, I mean, it's sort of a enforced group behavior that mm -hmm. happens mm -hmm. when people organize themselves into grids. <laughs> <laughs> so so off at Tyler School of Art you got into a little bit of chaos and that felt, that felt better <laughs> <laughs> so when you graduated you said you knew exactly what you wanted to do you found about in the second year you found design and mm -hmm. you were in love and do you attribute that to some educators who really turned you on or to you just finding your thing I had a teacher who really got me to move to New York. Uh, his name is Stanislaw Zagorski. He was a Polish illustrator, and he got me interested in typography. And I owe so much of my career to him because he, he saw that I was struggling with this sort of organization of Swiss modern style that most people were working with in the time, which was the typeface Helvetica, and you rubbed it down in press type, and mine never looked right. It was, they didn't go with the artwork that I made, and they were somewhat messy. And he said to me, illustrate the type. And when I heard those words, I started to understand that type had spirit and form and that I could take typography in, in a much more meaningful direction than I had been doing. And it was great. And then now I'm obsessive about it. But, <laughs> but he, was, he was the founding father. Okay. That's nice. To, he turned on the light bulb. And yep, that. <laughs> absolutely. He turned on the light bulb. And uh, he, he took me to New York and gave me lists of people to see for jobs. That he knew because wow. he worked there. He was an illustrator. He was actually he'd done the cover for Cream the, the, the Band, the band. Okay. In, in the in the sixties, and I was in art school. And my teacher had done yeah that's a best selling cool. album that was kind of amazing. It was Wheels of Fire, a silver album he'd done. It was gorgeous. Um, we were all so proud. That was big. Yeah. So you moved to New York City. Were your parents sort of like, see you later? Were you? Well, I, I remember I told my mother uh, I was going to move to New York, and she said, oh, "Oh, Paula, don't do anything like that. That sounds like it takes talent." 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of those. One of those. All right. Well, you did later, it anyway. Later, she was pro. You you were you weren't <laughs> looking for her validation necessarily at this point. Well, I, I, I knew what I wanted to do. And uh, it was different from what my, my family had envisioned for me. And that I think my mother wanted me to be a school teacher because she thought it was safe. She thought it was what I was doing was risky. My, our lifestyles were very different. And that was very rough in those days. I think later they came to accept it. My mother said that she never knew anybody who was ever a graphic designer. And then another generation of children grew up and there were many graphic designers. It became a you know a much more popular profession. So I think that they had reasonable fears. I mean, I don't think they were wrong necessarily. Yeah. No, they were just wrong about, they were just wrong for me. <laughs> right. So I understand when you landed in New York City, you, you had a couple of jobs before landing at CBS and you first landed at CBS in the ad department. Right. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Which you didn't find that to be a prestigious position. Well, I actually loved CBS records when I first got there because there are all kinds of people in the department who were sort of my age and oh. some of whom I'm still in touch with. Oh, that's nice. Uh, and they were young designers and I was in a group with them. So it was fun. And we had this hideous boss that we hated and we thought he was a jerk and made fun of him and laughed about him all the time. So you galvanized around your hatred. Totally. Terrible totally. Boss. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> it sounds like socially a pretty exciting place to be. It was totally great. Um, I used to make ads and I, I learned everything I know about politics from being in that advertising department. For example, I learned about the hierarchy of corporate approvals. Like I would make ads for Cashbox. I had a, a, a partner who was a copywriter named Marty Picard that I worked with, who I really liked. And he was funny. We made good ads together. And uh, we, would, we would draft an ad on Monday, and we'd make a layout on it, and it would be routed around the company. And Cashbox Box Magazine closed on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And that, so that you had, a, the ad had to be approved by, uh, it was Wednesday late in the day. It had to be approved by Wednesday morning. So that the ad would run, route around to the first person who would make some comment on it and come back for a revision. And then it would route around and he, they would approve it and go to the next person. They would reject it or do something else with it or say this sucks or whatever they'd write on it and would come back for And this thing would happen. Monday would be gone and then it would be Tuesday. We'd go through the same process again. And then whatever we sent up Wednesday morning went <laughs> because that, <laughs> that was the day the ad closed. So I just realized don't show anything till Wednesday morning. The work will be better because you can save the good work you do and just not let it circulate around for the... Oh, very astute. <laughs> <laughs> You're working the system. No, I figured the system. Yeah, so, yeah. No, I started to understand how politics worked. And, and when it, you understand how politics work, and you, you, it sounds like you didn't have any sort of apprehension or fear about, I don't know, maneuvering within the political system. I think a lot of that was my generation. You know, oh. that I, I felt that it was a game. Mm -hmm. And that you figured out, you figured out the rules and, and, and operate. I know that there are people within corporate hierarchies who, uh, whose opinions matter, and they will determine what's going to be done or not done, and there are a pile of people who work for them whose opinions don't matter. And mm -hmm. that if, you, if you're being blocked by those people and your work isn't being seen where you need it to be seen, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. you, know, that you have to work around that and make sure that the right person's saying it. There are a lot of people in jobs who just shouldn't have the jobs. They could probably take them away. I hate to say that, but it's true. Yeah, no, I've uh, I've seen it myself and in, in my industry. And the thing that I've noticed about myself is I always gave too much credit. Like I was willing to believe that. Well, there must be some reason they're here in this job, but I just I can't see it. But no. Well, wasn't. sometimes they were buffers for somebody else. They just delayed somebody having to make a decision about it because you go to this buffer first, it's irrelevant, but it keeps somebody who doesn't want to have to look at it from looking at it for a period of time. That's one reason they exist. Yeah, okay. Another reason they exist is because they might have good personalities and are a good company to have around. Yeah. You know, that, that existed too. I mean, I saw all of it. They were always men. Uh, yes. So I, <laughs> I definitely have questions about that. <laughs> I know you did end up getting recruited by Atlantic, yes. where you did some record covers, right. and then CBS got Hired you back, back. Right. and you did prolific work. My first year at Atlantic, I made 25 record covers, and they didn't have as big a, a roster. I mean, there just wasn't as much work. You know, it was a small department. It was a, an art director named Bob Deffern who I worked for, and it was really the two of us and I think a mechanical person in that department. Uh, and 
at Atlantic, the company was so small that the Erdogans approved things, so you would actually meet them. It, it was a very tiny company. Uh, CBS was enormous and had, there were 150 releases in a year in the pop and country department. And those were the things that I either designed or had to facilitate. Designing record covers in the early 70s sounds pretty boss. Yeah, man. it was pretty boss. I, you know, I was so stupid. I didn't even know I had a good job. I thought everybody had a job like me. Really? <laughs> yeah, it was so easy. It was so easy. I, I had I had a, an incredible piece of luck. I had a job uh, at Random House designing the insides of children's books, which was not a great job because there really wasn't much to design. My boss was a man named Herb Levitt. He got another job and he felt sorry for me. Like he thought if he let, we got along very well and he thought I would be left in this job and somebody else might not like me and I wouldn't be protected. And so he, he says, you know, you could leave and get another job. And he, he had a friend named Ted Bernstein who worked at CBS in the promotion department. And he called up Ted and he said, you should hire this girl. She's really good, but you know, she doesn't have any experience doing what you, you're doing, but I know she can learn it. And so he did. He, I, that's how I got hired. The first entry into the record industry was pure luck. The second part of it was luck against things I actually delivered because Bob Deffern hired me because he liked the ads I was doing mm -hmm. and he wanted me to do the ads and they did the ads and the covers in the same department. So I made the trade to get to do the covers. I didn't even, I wasn't even that sure I wanted to leave at the time um, because I, I really liked it there. Um, I liked my friends and it was fun. Atlantic. Leave a CBS for Atlantic. Oh, I see. And then when I left Atlantic, the opportunity was too great. All right. So it sounds like there you're in a male dominated industry, but so far we've had two your professor and then your art director at Random House yeah. um, that have sort of also opened doors for you. Absolutely. Recognizing your talent. Absolutely. That was great. There are angels and villains all over. Always. All aren't there? <laughs> That's what makes it interesting. <laughs> so tell me about the the designing record cover years. I know you're famous for some iconic ones that you don't love. Uh, <laughs> like Boston. Let's <laughs> get told, it out on the table. You've told that story a lot of times. I don't want to make you tell it again. But at the same time, doing 150 a year with varying degrees of creative freedom, you get pretty good at something. You get really fast. You get I, I, I learned my craft doing that. Yeah. And, and also that there was a, I was a, I was an art director and a designer because sometimes I purchased illustration and photography and put the just put the typography on it and that, that it was really the work of other people. And sometimes, sometimes I was a complete type configuration. It was all mine, but I really could find my own strengths. And I think back on it in relationship to my own staff who were about the age I was when I was working at CBS. And I thought, oh my God, they just don't have the opportunity I had because, because you made so many things. They produced these things and, and they were done without computers. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, they were all manually done and so much time went into craft, but it was so much fun. It was great. I'm nostalgic for it. I wasn't even there. <laughs> well, you know, the thing was that I, I'm, I'm gratified now about how I felt when, when album covers became CDs. And I thought, I don't want to work on them anymore. And I, a CD is such a stupid object. I mean, it's a record image stuck under plastic, you know, and, and the, everybody perceived that the plastic protected these things that were more durable than records, actually. And now I see vinyl back in stores and people gravitating towards buying these things, even buying record players, which seems so archaic. But I understand, I understand that passion for it. It's a wonderful way to hear music. It's a wonderful way to hear music. And I, I'm old enough to have grown up with records and made the transition to cassettes and then to CDs. And as a tactile experience, as a ceremonial experience, vinyl is hands down better than any of them. The CD was just such an ugly experience from trying to get the plastic off to opening it up to having to fish out the liner notes and, you know, leaf through it. It was always really uncomfortable and you, cassettes weren't, no. you know, worth talking about. But there's something really romantic about vinyl and part of it's the scale. I mean, it was big enough Absolutely. to be in your face and to spend time with it. And you could make up your own stories about the bands based on the spaceship on the, That's on right. the cover. Of a lot of stone people look at that for hours <laughs> yes. going, whoa, look at these guys going into space. Are there any uh, record covers that you designed from that era that, that you feel personally nostalgic for or that really are special to you? 
I'm a weird person in the record industry because I know a lot of really good record cover art directors and designers, and they were much more passionate about the music and the bands that I than I was. I was really interested in my craft. Mm. And so the things that I like most from that period, there's a series of album covers I did for Bob James' label, Tap and Z Records, that are all large-scale objects blown up out of scale and bleeding off the record covers like fried eggs or a mm. matchbook. Mm -hmm. And I still graphically th am impressed with them that I think that they held up and they look terrific. Um, and I like a lot of the covers I did with typography. Um, where I was experimenting with it, and and illustrations I bought and art directed. And I really like a couple of my rock bands, which I, I didn't like as much at the time. Like, I like the Cheap Trip covers I did. I did Springsteen's Darkness at the Edge of Town, mm -hmm. and it holds up as a cover Yeah, uh, really nicely. And um, I did a lot of covers for Billy Joel. Um, I did the Stranger cover, which was his breakout album. And, yeah, uh, I had uh, that as a kid. I'm glad I did them. They were great. I mean, those record covers really shaped a lot of people's important chapters in their lives. Is that... <laughs> Resonate yeah, it, well, absolutely. I mean, there, there, people will will tell me about it. It's funny. I got a, a, I was interviewed by a publishing company called Thirty Three and a Third, and what they do is they publish books about just one album, and they published a book about Cheap Trick, and so they called me to interview me because I, I had done, I think, the first four or five of their covers, and the covers all had typewriter type, and the bands there were the two good looking guys on the front and the funny looking ones on the back, and they were all like that. And he asked me a lot of questions about it, and then he said, "And you did the hand lettering on all the liner notes." It was, it was. It was my hand lettering that did, I wrote out by hand all the liner notes. And I thought, the reason I did that, and I remembered why I did it, and then we ended up doing on all of them, was that I didn't have time the time to typeset the first one because they were too late with the, with the lyrics. So I wrote them all by hand, and then I could make the corrections, and we wouldn't have to wait for the typesetting to come back. And then after that, I had to do them on every cover because I did them on the, every album because I did them on the first one. Because you became, said it. it became a thing, but yeah. I remembered why we did it, and that was that was very funny to me. I forgot. I totally forgot about it. And that was just an agile design decision. It was. Design? It was a time saving design yeah. decision. <laughs> <laughs> so, is CDs why you left the record business? Oh, there were a lot of reasons I left. One is I'd done it long enough, and I wanted to design something else. Uh, the other was I uh, heard you tell Debbie Bimlin you wanted to design something that wasn't square. Absolutely, I wanted. I wanted a page the turn maybe some dimension you know maybe yes. a big poster um i did want to really break out of that and then the the industry ran into financial difficulties and they were having layoffs and it was very scary there and the the what was the most fun became sort of depressing and de yeah it's terrible so i quit in 1982 and i started uh my own little freelance business and then i got a contract to work at time inc for a year and then in 1984, I started my own company. Your own company. What are the highs and lows from that chapter? Because you joined Pentagram in 1991. So from right. 84 to 91. 91. I had a, a company called Copel and Share with a partner named mm -hmm. Terry Copel. He and I went to college together. He was hilariously funny. We were silly and we started a business and we did pretty well for until the Bush recession. Some of the work is really well known. Some of it was very controversial because it was a postmodern period, and I took a lot of criticism for it at a certain period of time. Things like historicism and things like that that were existed in the design press, but mostly uh, we had fun. I we never made a huge amount of money, but we didn't do badly. I started teaching around 1982, and I began hiring my students, which I still do, and they staffed the place. And it was a lot of it was a, a hot little shop for a period of time. It was great. <laughs> And then, then it wasn't. In uh, 89, Terry's uh, specialty was magazine design. Magazines really go bust in recessions. And so he lost a lot of the business he had, and he had to take a staff job because he couldn't draw a salary because we just didn't have enough money to do it. And I sort of kept the business going for two years when two uh, of the partners of Pentagram came around and asked me if I'd be interested in joining. Okay. And I was. And can you elaborate on why you were interested in joining Pentagram at that time? Was it a strength in numbers kind of thing? I was approaching 40. Mm -hmm. and I, no, I was 40, actually, when they asked me. But I, was, I remember at the end of my 30s during the recession. I started to know that as a woman in business, I was not going to get bigger jobs than the jobs I was getting. And the problem with the jobs that I was getting is they were mostly 
culturally driven or youth driven because I'd come out of the record industry. So my reputation as a record cover designer brought me other work. Like I did the Swatch Watch first campaigns when they came to the States. I did a candy store that was supposed to look hip called Ola. Um, and I did lots of books, but I never got big identity projects. The only identity I designed was for Manhattan Records. So I, I saw see. I saw a situation where the work was not going to grow, and then younger people were going to be doing what I was doing, and I'd be competing with people 10 years younger than me, and that was a bad position. Panagram had a really established reputation. I, the New York office, at the point I joined it, did not impress me that much because most of the work in the United States was annual report design, which I had no interest in doing. The London office did a lot of identities. When I went to London, I felt like they owned the city. They did a lot of cultural work. They did a lot of work for big corporations, but it was very important, powerful work. And my friend Michael Beirut and I joined uh, the New York office within six months of each other, and I think it changed the office. But the thing about Pentagram was I knew that I was joining a boys' club Mm -hmm. And I was the only woman to do it at that point. They didn't have a, a, a woman partner who'd come on, on in on their own. It was a challenge. On the other hand, I knew that I was going to be protected by a football team. And I wouldn't be a, a woman alone sort of struggling the way I was in the last couple of years at Copel and Cher. So you felt uni uniformly embraced by the boys club? Uh, no, they were rotten brats. Okay. <laughs> they were, they had but they own. weren't going to let you go down because that would mean Pentagram's name. Went right. Ex it. Exactly. Okay. Sometimes they were nasty. Sometimes they were they would ignore me or make me feel outside the group, but they never undermined me. Well, that's unique. Yes, I think so. Because in that time, right, first of all, don't even get me started on the what a Me Too minefield it must have been but um and i'm not talking about pentagram specifically just in general in the workforce to be a badass woman is going to threaten a lot of male egos well when i designed the public theater and i i took it to london they just ripped it you know they they walked out of the room they were so offended by my typography i had i'd committed typographic blasphemy it was really it was really something and i was shocked i didn't i didn't expect that kind of reaction it was my best work at that time. And, and then, of course, it, it got so much acclaim that they felt like jerks. But, <laughs> right. but, but so you didn't have to put them in their place. Well, you know, they, 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 that, that evening anyway. before before it had gotten the kind of plaudits, uh, uh -huh. I was demolished. I just felt I felt so terrible. I felt like, why are these guys walking out on this? I think this is good work. They were mean. I'm sorry about that. Did they come around pretty quickly? I mean, no, no, they were, they were they were they were ratty, and and then they made jokes about it like five years later. Five but, years later, but right? Fine. But the four for four <laughs> years, you were just sort of quietly. You had to suffer your victory quietly, right? Because you can't. But the world changed. They they were bad, but they weren't any worse than anyone else I'd experienced. Well, yeah, no, I feel <laughs> you on that. <laughs> and we all like find the way that works for us to navigate that situation. But well, I, I some of that is fair. I mean, I think that if you make a decision to walk into a form of existence which is you know business oriented in mm -hmm. in in a society that's been invented and ruled by men, and you expect them all of a sudden to change the way they play the game, I don't think that's a reasonable expectation. No, I, I, and, I hear and, you on that. And you... so that the question is, that's fair, but don't cheat. Yes. <laughs> yes. And at least let if I'm if you've invited me in here to play the game with you, if I <laughs> slam dunk the ball, give me a fucking high five. <laughs> Don't make me feel bad about it. Well, they honestly, this is the part where I feel better than than they do. They didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> they thought they were right, and you they had just, to show they, them they, they were wrong. Did, they just didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> So you've you've been with Pentagram for a really long time now. It's fair to say that you've uh, you've designed identities that have absolutely worked their way into our collective subconscious and in incredible and powerful ways. Do you feel powerful? Not especially. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And, and, well, my husband Seymour Quas, he was a legend when I met him, and he 
makes work all the time. And what I learned from him is that you're in this thing to make stuff. Mm -hmm. And that when you're making stuff, that's terrific. And if people has have a great response to it or it, it affects it affects the way they feel about society or whatever they do, that's terrific. But you're only as good as your last piece and you got to keep making it. I don't think about those things because they don't have anything to do with why I'm doing it. You know, they're not they're they're a byproduct of it. And and the point is the next one. Okay. I'm following you on that. And I I hear you that you can't really make something purely if you're thinking about how it's going to resonate with culture and that well, you can't you can't know that you can't know I that. Mean, you can't you can only make suppositions. I mean, I just finished a book on the public theater. It'll be out in March and that I wrote the book completely from an identity perspective of it is that as identity designers, you we assume we're going to make these things that people are going to rec recognize and they're going to affect the culture and they're going to affect the culture positively for the corporations and the the organizations that need these things. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is there's no way we could know. I designed the public theater posters in 1994 and I had, there was no way I could have anticipated Instagram. Right. You know, and, right. and, and all the things that change the way you communicate, you know, you, and you do these things and then you have to adjust for them and you have to be aware of them and then you have to move on to the next thing. It's always a sequence of growth. That's the way that the, the industri industry works. I worked through every kind of technology in the 50 years I've been working. I mean, I worked on a Lucy machine. That was the thing that blew mm -hmm. things up. <laughs> like yeah. a really, really silly object. And I'll talk to students and they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they never saw an X-Acto knife, you know, I just started, let alone a razor oh, blade. God, you so know? many of us lost fingertips <laughs> with those X-Acto knives. <laughs> so, so, you know... These are all the tools that, that you go through time and you remember and, and you're on to something new and the next thing. But it, it is really, really the next thing you do that matters. I concur. But at some time, can you not look back at your life and take pride in the work that you've contributed? I see a lot of flaws. Uh, I also, know and then if I want to be reminded of them, there's always the Boston cover. <laughs> all right. What fascinated me about that cover, what I really, really love about it is that it seems to live on and that it, it's something that it became part of vernacular and that that is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I can't say that that's me, you know, like that, that's, that's circumstance of a graphic existing at a certain point of time of hitting some zeitgeist in 1976, which predated Star Wars, which was 1977. And all of a sudden there are these, you know, the sort of cartoony, painting of spaceships leaving the earth and 16 year old boys just love them mm -hmm. you know just like they like the star wars movie and still do and like it 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 seemed to hit the zeitgeist which i which really had nothing to do with with my input because i wasn't looking at it like that we that was a silly idea to solve a problem with a with tom Scholz, who was the director of the band who was the leader of the band and he wanted we thought he would like it because he wanted something science like on the cover because he was from mit but you don't think you can claim any sort of consciousness of the zeitgeist? No. Really? You don't know those things. It's like it's like exactly the same in, in the public book of, of how you, you're moving along solving specific problems as you understand them within the context of the realm of the time and where you're working. The idea that you are predicting these things or that these things become culture are happenstance and they're happenstance against your supposition that it might work that's all sometimes okay. they do sometimes they don't and and that's what we do right <laughs> <laughs> so your supposition that it might work that's sort of like the scientific hypothesis right. right how do you form these suppositions especially when you're dealing with an identity that's a big messy thing to filter out through something that's graphically recognizable well, sometimes it's not hard. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, it really, it depends upon what it's for and what it needs to do. Okay. Uh, probably the fastest identity I ever designed was the Highline logo. I knew what it was because I had to do it for free and I wanted to get rid of this thing fast. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, it was an H. It was easily a railroad track. It was a, you know, a park. It was a perfect, it was a perfect symbol for them. It was, e it was easy to do. When they're easy to do, they're usually right because mm -hmm. you, you sort of put together uh, two disrelated pieces of information that both connect to one thing, and that's gonna that's gonna create a narrative. Okay. In most situations, with with clients and doing identities, I ask them a lot of questions about where they are, how they got there, where they want to go, what do they like, what do they don't like, and that's what I'm doing with you right now. 
That's exactly. <laughs> well, that's how you find out stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Then you solve. Yeah. Okay. You've had, you said 50 years in the business now. Just about. Yeah. So that's a lot of projects under the, under your belt. And I'm assuming you get to choose no. which projects you want to take on. No. no, no, no. Sometimes I, sometimes I'm very, very busy and I can turn things down and sometimes I'm not. Okay. You know, so I would say that I'm picking and choosing. I'd say the projects are better than things I'd been offered before, but and I do turn down things I don't want to do, but not if I'm not busy. Do you have any criteria that that are that is deal breaker, like well, or the criteria for the ideal projects you'd like to take? Well, I don't like working with advertising agencies because I don't like the way the projects are structured. I like to have a direct con client with a contact. And when you work with an advertising agency, they're a middleman between mm. you and the client. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that gets lost in communication. But I like working with people who work in marketing departments or advertising departments inside corporations. I find them to be good clients, but not, not agencies because agencies are still pleasing somebody else. And I'd rather meet those people first than have to go through the agency because it doesn't really matter what they think since they're still at the mercy of somebody else. It's sort of like the same hierarchical thing from CBS. Yes. It's like that, that's <laughs> not a good relationship. I want to talk to the person who says yes or no. I don't want to talk to 20 million mid, middlemen because I can't get anything done that way. And that's a waste of time. So that it factors into how I make a decision. I, Pentagram as a whole tends not to work a lot with middle management. There are a lot of projects that exist on a middle management level, mm -hmm. and they're very difficult to achieve anything successful because you're not dealing with final decision makers. And are you in a position now where you can you can sort of say, like, I'm not, I'm only going to deal with the, the people who are final decision makers? And Well, I mostly get dr projects where the final decision makers are involved because yeah. if it's the identity of a company. Why wouldn't they be? We're, right, right. You know, so it, it, I may be working with a chief marketing officer. And that's that's the client, and that's fine because they're say one level below the CEO and in the structure of the company. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be working at a very low level and having to sell up because you can't get anywhere with it. Right. You know, that's like doing the billboard ad on Monday and waiting, <laughs> <laughs> making tons of revisions until all the soul is sucked out of your ad, <laughs> and it goes through on Wednesday. That's right. <laughs> Still, though, there are all of these people involved in a project. If you're dealing with the upper management or the people who are making the decisions, I'm sure you've got people on your team that are in various positions, serving various roles. Right. How would you describe the way that you do the dance, like that you navigate all the different personalities and relationships that have to come together to make a successful piece of work? That's right. That's what I do. I navigate the, that terrain. We craft presentations that are designed to teach, really to sort of educate somebody about where something is going and what the possibilities are, and if it's a very big corporation. So and that when they see this, they can interpret what well, the intention is. And well, the thing is, what you want to do is play back to somebody visually what they want. In other words, what they're looking for in relationship to their company. And to find that out is generally you ask a lot of questions about their milieu. Like, what what is the reason for doing the identity? What's wrong with what you got? If you could change that, what would it be? Any part of it you would keep or would you throw everything out and start from the ground? Who do you admire? What do you think is good? Who are your competitors? What do they look like? I mean, that you're looking, you're asking all these questions to find out what a preference is and that you generally can isolate. I found that in a recent company I worked for that they hated the logo and they'd like to throw it out, but they didn't mind the color. You know, and they didn't they didn't mind what the logo was. They just didn't like the way it was done. You find this thing out and then you realize, well, OK, you can keep pieces of the component, but you can you can craft something completely new out of it. So it doesn't feel like like a dated thing. And that's that's what you do. And you find it's easy pretty much to get agreement about it because you've they pretty much told you. Ah. exactly how to do it. <laughs> and then you can communicate that pretty easily to the other people on your team that are helping you. Execute. Oh, yeah, they know. They know my team. They know exactly what I'm talking about. And, okay. and that's, we, we start with hand drawn sketches and we sort of sketch back and forth to each other until we know what we're going to work up. Then we work it up on the computer. Then we have little, little yeah. sort of things. And we, we make, make it become sort of baked into both of you. Right. And it's the best part of the job. You know, yeah. That part. Yeah. It's really fun. It's I can really see fun. it in your yeah. eyes. No, it's great. You, you really enjoy that. Yeah, no, it's great. I love it. <laughs> what is it about that back and forth that you really like? 
it's the well, fine tuning. Is no, it? we're making stuff. Yeah, you know, it's stuff. you know, like I, it's the part of the job where you think, "Ooh, this is going to be the best thing I've ever done." It never <laughs> yeah. is. It never is. But you always think for well, that think... moment in time, "Ooh, this is really going to be good." <laughs> yeah, oh, it's so exciting. That is a good feeling. Yeah, and then it lasts for a second. <laughs> it's over. But it, <laughs> then you chase it after, you chase that high, and the next one. <laughs> and then, you know, then it only goes down. You know, I, I, I did this diagram of a meeting like that where you present <laughs> something and you've got. That you've got the group up to the highest level of expectation, and then somebody sort of rebuts, and they bring it down, they bring it down lower, and then you sort of pull it back, and you start talking it up again, and you get to one point where it's about as high as it's going to go, and the meeting must end there. Because it'll never get <laughs> it'll that high again. Never get that high again. <laughs> that is brilliant, <laughs> and it's so true, and if. I think I've definitely been in meetings where it's just gone down and down, and, and I'm just trying to wrestle it back so hard. Instant death. You can't. <laughs> okay, you've been in enough meetings to really figure that out. I've been in a lot of meetings. Okay, you're also a painter and an educator. Tell me about what those offer you creatively and what you offer to them creatively. Well, the painting came out of a desire to make things again tactily like being the kid in the room mm -hmm. you know because i felt i think in the in by the late 90s i felt like i really didn't touch anything anymore and i missed it so i in my weekend house i started painting these large scale maps which i had done small scale before i decided to really invest energy into it I accomplished a number of them, and a friend of mine saw them and took them to his gallery, and they gave me a show. So I started painting on a more serious level uh, than I anticipated, almost within a year or two of, of beginning doing it. And so I've been really doing it every, ever since. I have one gallery for my paintings, another gallery for my prints, though both of them can sell either one. Sometimes I'm very active, like I, I, I working on a exhibit now, but I haven't for the past couple of years because I was taking commissions, which I don't really like, but I took the money, which was fun. <laughs> um, but, but, I you know, I fun. do them, I do them in spurts and um, I like them. I'm not tired of them yet. They're pretty meticulous. They're, they're, they're big. dense, they're big dense. and dense big with and information. Dense. Absolutely. The exact opposite of the Highline logo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and is there something about that? I mean, are you almost creating projects for yourself that are long and dense and well yeah involved, i did that so i did that end? well no they end they usually take about four to six months so really if i'm having okay. a show they have to end right right. right. but but if they're big and i'm working on a, a very big painting now which i think i'll complete in about two more weeks but i've been working on it for about five months i think the thing with them is that they are the opposite of what I do all day, which is make fast decisions and think of things quickly and, and delineate them quickly. Okay. And that this is slow and laborious and it's the opposite of what I do all day. That makes a lot of sense. Do the maps have anything to do with your, your father was a map maker, That's correct? Right. That's right. My father was, he was a photogrammetric engineer. He was involved in the science of photography and he started working as a field survey man in on the TVA in, I think, Roosevelt's last term. And he kept finding that the maps he, were he was using were inaccurate for plotting where you were going to put equipment because the curvature of the Earth distorted the view of the map, and mm -hmm. which is what happened in aerial photography in those times. So he invented this device that he called stereo templates, which were three different size holes that somehow worked as a measuring device. It worked on lenses. A photogrammetric engineer is the science of cameras. And what the measurement did is it adjusted the way the lens was positioned within the ca camera to compensate for the curvature of the earth. So it corrected le legend uh, sort of distortion in aerial photography, which Google Maps would not exist without that computation. Whoa. If you think about, you know, like what happens, you yeah. know, and even you even see some funky stuff there. If you actually blow it up big enough, you see you see how the how the lens doesn't work. But you know, he was a civil servant and he worked for the government and he was proud of it and he was proud of what he did. And the government gave him fifteen hundred dollars for the patent. And uh, he was coordinator of nations mapping, and they made these really beautiful uh, government maps. And you know, I think about contemporary politics and there's part of me that's really glad my father is dead so he couldn't see this he was such a proud civil servant yeah 
stabs you in the heart. A bit. Yeah, he worked for a lot of administrations that were different Republicans or Democrats. I mean, I never heard him say, oh, I can't work for that Republican president. My God. Right. No. It they was, didn't do that. It wasn't done. There's a lot more honor in it. Did you have a good relationship with your dad? Later. Yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, I liked when he told me about the maps because I thought that distortion meant lying. And I thought that the maps were dishonest, you know, that, that <laughs> he had to fix up the dishonesty. In the maps. <laughs> when I was an adult, I liked him a lot. Yeah. Adulthood does that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just kind of curious. You've seen a lot. You've just in terms of the tools of your trade, everything's changed. What feels really important to you right now? Socially, culturally, scientifically, philosophically, any, any way you want to take that question, I'll take your answer. Well, the state of the country is a, a little unnerving. I've never lived in a time well, like this. It's I mean, incredibly turbulent. And uh, scary. And it's scary. Um, it makes me worry for the fate of democracy. And uh, I don't know what to do with a country that's divided up by their media. You know, during the Vietnam War, we were all watching the same three television networks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the person everybody trusted was Walter Cronkite. And when Walter Cronkite came out against the Vietnam War, the whole country turned. It was like they all could move around and join together because they were all watching the same guy and they trusted him. He was the most trusted man in America. There's nobody like that now. There's no way there are two realities. And it's really scary. I don't know what to make of people who live in the other reality. Like, I don't, I, I feel like either they're crazy or they're dishonest. I, I just don't understand it. I don't understand them. I do, part of me doesn't want to be citizens with them. This mm -hmm. is just the way I feel. I feel like, mm -hmm. God, you're alien. What is this about? Do you want to be, you, what kind of government do you want to have? What kind of country do you want to have? I feel like the two sides have also been looking through filters that are distorted for their own perspective. Well, I'm sure they are. I, I see distortion on both sides, but not much worse on one side. Yeah. Do you see any avenues for cohesion? I really am confused. I don't, you know, I think that the problem I see is that our old battlegrounds, which were fairly reasonable on left and right, had to do with more government versus less government, and more taxes versus less taxes, and more social programs versus less social programs. And that, that was swell, <laughs> because both viewpoints in balance work better together than all one or all the other. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what made government work. And now I see things that aren't really about that. You know, I mean, a lot of fear I, and hate. Well, yes, fear and hate and, and belief systems that are not founded in fact. Um, and outright corruption. Well, that too. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, 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 the corruption is, is, is terrifying, but it, the corruption is supported by people not wanting to acknowledge what's going on because they've decided they want, they don't want to look at it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to do, I don't know how you deal with that. I don't either. But there's something comforting about worrying about it together. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know it doesn't feel <laughs> it doesn't feel great. Yes, does. No, I'm really, I'm really concerned. I keep, I keep thinking there's going to be this aha moment where it all resolves itself, and it never does. Right. It just seems to be worse and worse, and and quite horrific and embarrassing. I mean, just just like what happened to this this terrific country? What happened to us? Wish I had an answer for you, but I share your concern. Well, that's what I'm concerned about. Um, yeah, I did. I did ask you that question. <laughs> so, so you asked me that. I mean, that's sort of my biggest concern. I'm a, on a personal level, I think I would say I'm most concerned with what I'm going to be making next and doing next, and that I need to to feel that because when I think that there isn't that next thing that I'm going to make or do, I get very depressed. And you're a very forward thinking person. Yes. Are you? Yeah, I have to be. I always have to be in motion. So, always right. in motion and always looking ahead. Right. You don't seem like nostalgia is anything that. Well, I have nostalgia for for various things. What do you but... have nostalgia for? <laughs> Sometimes I have nostalgia for Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Nostalgic about you know things in the in my past and old songs and movies and and things like that. But 
th- my drive is forward. Mm-hmm. I'm not in retrograde. You, you never had children? No. Do you feel in, in any way like your work is a contribution? Yeah, I do. Uh, that's sort of my kid. Yeah. <laughs> and and the people that have worked for me. Sure. You know? I sure. Mean, you're, you have a hand in shaping their right. lives, their right. careers, influencing them. I ask you more for my own reasons because I don't have children either. And I'm. Is that your choice? Just, I, I just sort of never got my shit together in time or a partner in time to do it. And so it kind of happened that way. Mm-hmm. But I, oh, I wrestle. I have some of that. Some yeah. Of that. I wrestle with how to make sure I'm contributing. I think that's really important, you know, that I think that uh, the thing about parenthood is it it takes up a lot of you. And if you're not doing that, what are you doing? But it's got to mean something. Well, I I worked through a lot of pain in my whole life. You know, like I told you how I, how I, how I started working as a little kid and that Making things is my way of having life move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's that's how I progress. And that's how I don't fall into despair, which is easy to do if you don't have something that brings you out of it. Have you fallen into despair? Sure. Okay. And you pulled yourself out with making things. Absolutely. Yeah. I fall into despair almost every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't flip on the news. <laughs> it's very easy to fall into despair at any given moment. Okay. So as a forward thinker, which way is the uh, vehicle pointed now? I want to be able to do a design for every type of company I ever wanted to work for. And I want to make sure I do one of each before I go. And I want to be able to continue my paintings and to evolve them. Right now, I'm painting hurricanes, which is a lot of fun. Get to make a lot of swirls over the maps. I'd like to do things with the paintings that are three-dimensional. Somebody asked me to paint an art car. I really want to do that. I get asked to do interesting things from time to time in terms of doing murals, and I like doing, doing those things. And I just want those to continue, and I don't want people to stop asking me. Yeah, I hear you. Is there anything outside of the graphic design painting world that you really want to do? I don't know, skydiving or you know, I'm no. just no. No. <laughs> no. I don't want to go sky I don't want to go skydiving. I don't definitely don't want to play a sport. I like to go swimming, but that I do it on my own pace. Okay. No adventure that's sort of Well, I would there there's travel I would like to do, but I just don't I haven't been able to figure out how to make it part of my timetable. Gotcha. And I think if I really wanted to do it, I would have. Right. So people always ask me about work-life balance. What's wrong with not having a life? <laughs> <laughs> Where did that come my from? Work my work is my life. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm not going to suddenly take up golf. Yuck. I'm not, I just won't. I just don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't have to. Nobody's making you. <laughs> do you allow yourself to feel successful? Or does that feel lazy somehow? I know a lot of my, my partners. We're all successful. Yeah. My, my partners are all. I mean, live yeah, no, I'm not know. asking you to feel special. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm bad at that. <laughs> I can no, I, I, I mean, you can look back at your life and say, yeah, I did something with merit. The thing is, sometimes I feel like a fraud, I have to admit. Like, you know, you know that you give a presentation, everybody says, oh, gee, you're terrific. Oh, thank you. But, you know, and they're asking questions like I'm some kind of guru. And I really don't feel like that at all as a person. And it's not it's not about being trying to be modest or anything. It's just like it feels icky. <laughs> I'm not, I don't have the interest in being that person. That's not what I'm about. I'm about the making of the thing. If you want to ask me how you make it, I can tell you how to make it. If you want to ask me how did you get it made, I can tell you how it got it. But, you know, like, do you feel sick? No, I don't feel successful about it. I feel like that's what I do. and that. But that- you don't feel ineffective. No, I'm not. You can't make that stuff and be ineffective. Right. Right. So I guess that's what I, I guess really what I'm asking is what's your definition of effective or success? And I'm not asking you to feel like a guru or special, but 
you know, executing on your vision is a kind of success, right? I feel sometimes I, it. sometimes I, I, I can really feel it and I feel yeah. great. Like when I feel like I've solved something and I've made somebody else see it, I feel terrific. Because that's what I want to have happen. So, of course, I feel terrific, you know, but I also feel terrific if I get a really good haircut, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? It's still. You know, so it's, just, it's like, oh, good, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are just phenomenal to talk to. I've really, really enjoyed this. And there it is. Heartfelt thanks to Paula Cher for sharing her story. And many thanks to Adobe Max and Airstream for hosting us for this chat. And of course, thanks to all of you for listening. To see images of Paula's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app, or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please consider giving a rating and a review. It really does help a lot. Find us on social and share your thoughts. On Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, we're at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is created and produced by me, Amy Devers, along with Jamie Derringer. Our production company is 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.